Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we, we, sorry for running late uh, for the seminar. Uh, we have uh, the speaker uh, this week. Uh, it's um, Professor Niv um, from the uh, uh, University of uh, University College Dublin. And uh, uh, she is a prof full, full, full professor there. And uh, she, she currently has a visiting position at the Department of Bioengineering. It, it, it's a pleasure to have the, the first uh, hybrid seminar uh, in, in, in this year. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Um, well, so nice to be here. Um, so great, it's lovely to see you all. Um, and uh, hello to the people joining remotely as well. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right into the science. Um, so how to grow an elbow. Okay, so uh, so the, the title of the talk is how to grow an elbow, but we're going to start off with hips. So um, a condition that our uh, the, the group works on a lot is called developmental dysplasia of the hip or DDH. So hip dysplasia happens when the uh, proximal femur and the acetabulum don't form a tight uh, link. So the hip the hip isn't securely isn't a secure joint. So in this image here on your right, uh, that's a healthy hip. Uh, of a child, not a baby, kind of a, a youngish child. Uh, on the other side, so on your left, uh, there's a malformed proximal femur that is dislocated out of the also malformed acetabulum. Um, and, and hip dysplasia occurs because of um, a, something gone wrong in the process of morphogenesis, which is morphogenesis just means the creation of shape. Um, and particularly, specifically for joint morphogenesis, which is mostly cartilage prenatally. Um, we do know, however, that mechanical loading is important for uh, joint shape morphogenesis, including for hip dysplasia. So lots of the risk factors for hip dysplasia are related to an abnormal mechanical environment in utero or postnatally. Um, but what, what isn't known is, first of all, what's happening at the cell level to make a normal hip joint or elbow joint, and, and why is the elbow joint different to the hip joint? They're, they're always different in shape when a baby's born, but we don't know what the cell level processes are that creates that shape. Um, and we also then don't know that we know mechanical loading is important for joint shape, but we don't know how that modulates or um, promotes certain types of cell activities. So um, the kind of model that we have um, proposed is that we have a starting shape, a starting joint shape, could be any joint. Um, there's a certain level of cell activity that will occur anyway, regardless of mechanical loading, shown here in blue. Uh, then there's um, biophysical stimuli, stresses and strains that will occur due to movement, for example, but also internal stresses that then somehow promote a, a different set of cell activities. Um, now, I've shown here the mechanobiological and the biological cell activities as being additive. Uh, I actually no longer believe that. I believe it's more that the biophysical stimuli would modulate the, um, the biological cell activity to, to then bring about uh, another shape. But, but the, the premise is the same, that we have biophysical stimuli uh, impacting on the final cell activities that lead to the final joint shape. Um, so I'm going to talk through a number of projects all around this question. Um, and the nice thing is, I, I, I at least refer to each of the four, there's four people still uh, in the group here in Imperial. And uh, the first project I'm going to talk about is Yu Mings, who had his PhD file on Monday. Uh, so I said almost doctor, because yeah, he, yeah, he, um, it, it'll, be, it'll be confirmed very soon. Um, so the start of this story was back in May 2017, we had beam time at Diamond Light Source where we imaged um, mouse limbs uh, from different ages. Uh, so these are all embryonic limbs uh, from different ages and also for normal and abnormal mechanical loading. So the mechanical, the abnormal mechanical loading was from a genetically modified line that we use, which has no skeletal muscle. So they grow uh, in the absence of any spontaneous movements. Um, and then Yu Ming came onto the, the project and started working on this data set in order to, to figure out what are the cell level, level activities leading to joint shape and how does mechanical loading play a role in, in those activities. Um, so the workflow was we imaged the elbow joint um, with phase contrast synchrotron imaging. We focused in on the distal humerus and that is because the elbow joint has previously been shown to be affected, strongly affected by mechanical loading in utero. 
Um, you may design a workflow to identify and label every single cell in the joint or well, in the distal humerus. Uh, and then there was all these characteristics we could get out of them, like size, so cell size, cell orientation, um, cell density, and also an even cell proliferation. So by looking at the shape and kind of orientation of the cells adjacent to each other, um, he was able to extract where and how many of the cells are proliferating. Um, so, so what did we find? Well, here's the three, we looked at three wild type stages, so 23, 24, and 25, and that's between 14 and a half and 16 and a half embryonic days. So the TS there is for Tyler stage, which is the um, standardized staging system for the mouse. Um, what we saw, first of all, is that they change in size. So the, the outlines that you see at the top there, just each, each line is one sample. So they get bigger over time and they also change in shape with the, the main difference in shape being uh, this. So here on, the, on your right is the medial condyle that gets bigger uh, as development progresses so that it's the same as the lateral condyle. So this kind of differential shape change. Um, so the volume increases, that isn't a surprise from looking at the outlines. Uh, the proportion of matrix stays the same. Uh, which was interesting, um, and the number of cells dramatically increases, um, which is also expected. Um, the next thing we looked at was cell size, and what we saw, which has never been reported, it was a dramatic increase in cell size, coinciding with the same time period where we had a dramatic increase in overall size, uh, suggesting here that cell size, at least at these stages, or at the 24 to 25 stage, is a key um, component of growth, um, which which is um, which is exciting because that had never been reported. Um, looked at cell orientation, so each um, line there, well, you can't see them as lines because there's so many of them, but each of those are lines showing the orientation um, and the, the color coded according to orientation. And um, what we found for orientation was there was no difference over the three different ages, but there was a difference that was consistent within each age, that there was a different orientation between the humeral shaft, so the straight bit of the bone, and the two condyles, the two outgrowths. So if we look at that um, these are the violin plots here. Um, uh, so we have here M is medial condyle, L is lateral condyle, and H is humeral shaft. And each, each, for each of the three stages, we have a significant difference between the humeral shaft and the medial lateral condyle, but not between the medial, but not between the condyles. And then if we look at these kind of average uh, orientations here, we can see that the, the, you know, we have a visible difference in, the, in how they're oriented. So what this implies is that orientation um, isn't, likely isn't playing a dominant role in growth, but could be influencing local um, shape change, uh, particularly in the condyles. Um, then so for proliferation, so proliferation has always been assumed to be the dominant mechanism behind the joint morphogenesis, growth and morphogenesis. Um, and what this, so this, what we found is that um, it doesn't uh, change significantly over the three stages we looked at, but, but of particular interest is we have a downward trend of proliferation, even between 24 and 25, which is where we saw this dramatic increase in, sh in size of the joint, you know, indicating that proliferation, while of course is important, uh, isn't the dominant mechanism uh, for growth uh, or is unlikely to be the dominant mechanism for growth in the stages we have uh, looked at. So um, the next question is then, okay, so that's nice. We've shown, we've indicated that cell size, cell number, and um, cell orientation are likely to be involved in size and shape of joints, joint development. Um, so how does mechanical loading then um, play in this. So this, yeah, this is just a summary here of key, key mechanisms, number of cells, cell size, and potentially uh, orientation. Okay, yeah, so what about the mechanics? So what happens when we remove skeletal muscle, or, or well, there's embryos that don't have skeletal muscle, um, what happens to their joints? We only have two stages so far, uh, so Yu Ming's working on, a, on another stage at the moment. Um, uh, but for the two stages, uh, well, first of all, there wasn't a dramatic change in size. So here in this graph on the left, there's no significant differences in volume. There's some subtle, there is variation in the shape, so the shapes are a bit abnormal um, in the musculus. And the proportion matrix wasn't affected, significantly anyway. And the number of cells wasn't significantly affected within the two stages, um, but it was affected. There was a dramatic increase in the number of cells from 23 to 24 musculus. Um, 
when we looked at our cell size, we saw a big change in cell size of TS24. And um, so between the wild type and muscle, that's the big, a big decrease in cell size. And um, which is uh, which is important in that because well, it's kind of relevant in the fact that we didn't see an overall decrease in size. And so what we think what we think is happening is it's been slightly compensated for by additional matrix, even though we didn't see a significant difference in matrix. Um, but when we looked at cell orientation, we saw something very interesting as well. Um, so, well, here, this is the overall data, but when we looked quantitatively at, at particularly at TS24, we completely lose our regional variation and orientation. Um, and this is our, here, but down below in blue, you can see the modal orientations for the, for the three different regions. Um, so implying that mechanical loading is influencing or directing uh, cell orientation in the development joint. Um, and proliferation then, while it was only significant at one stage, we did see a significant decrease in proliferation uh, in the muscleless limbs. Um, so uh, even though proliferation wasn't, um, wasn't significantly different between stages and the wild types, it does, it is, does seem to be mechanically uh, regulated. So just to conclude then for what, what we found in the cell level activities uh, that are mechanoregulated, uh, cell size is mechanoregulated, and uh, proliferation is as well, uh, and then also orientation, but with this, this variation over the two different stages. So it'll be interesting to see when we look at it another a later time point if we see these uh, being consistent. Um, okay, so data like this is lovely. Um, it's very dense uh, and except with this data alone, we're, we're making correlations. We're not really proving that cell size is the most important thing for, you know, wild type joint morphogenesis. So that's where um, another uh, project comes in, which um, has an, an Joe, another student in the group has been working on. And, and that is computational stimulation of um, growth. So Joe started off working on the zebrafish, and um, so this is a collaborative project with uh, Chrissy Hammond in Bristol, and uh, working on the zebrafish jaw joint. So the zebrafish jaw larval jaw joint, so the, the embryo of, of zebrafish. So the great thing about the zebrafish is it's really small, and you can see every single cell under confocal microscopy. You can track the same fish over different time points, and that's what uh, Joe has done. So has this the same set of fish over a period of uh, two days, in which a lot happens because it's development, um, tracked the cells and then calculated growth maps. So here we can see the growth maps, growth field. Here is, is kind of rate of growth and local directions in, we can see them there, they're you know, sort of basically the direction, orientation of growth. And uh, so this is how, this isn't the model, this is just how the shapes change over time and how the elements grow. Um, so we have two rudiments, they're growing in size, they're changing in shape, moderately changing in shape, as we said. Um, and so this is what happens normally. Um, so Joe built a found an element model, which in which the growth rates were incorporated and then kind of simulated growth of these, uh, of the jaw joint, the zebrafish jaw joint. And basically you got a really, really nice prediction. So there's four different time windows. And um, so, you know, here in blue is the initial shape, the real initial shape, orange is the predicted shape and green is the target shape. And you can see that, you know, it does pretty well um, in predicting changes in shape and size. Um, and the really cool thing about computational simulations like this is you can really start to kind of break down what's actually, what's the active process here and what's more important between in this, in this, what, what Joe looked at was more important between growth uh, rate, so the amount of growth and how it regionally varies, and the direction of growth. So she was able to run simulations which were um, to look at the growth, uh, the impact of growth heterogeneity. So basically there's anisotropic growth, but it's the same level across the rudiment. And then um, the impact of growth orientation where you've heterogeneous growth, but isotropic directions, so, so no directionality. And what happened was, so here, so orange is um, the full simulation, turquoise is the homogeneous anisotropic, and purple is heterogeneous isotropic. And the, the ones, the one, the orange and the um, turquoise overlay pretty well. So basically when there's homogeneous anisotropic uh, growth, you get effectively almost the same shape, meaning that in the zebrafish jaw joint, orientation is not important for these particular stages. So it's it's a homogeneity of um, sorry, 
No, I've got that wrong, haven't I? How much you use? This is always nice to know. Um, orientation, not important. No, orientation is important. Yes. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, which is, so, um, yeah, let me just go back to this. Homogeneous isotropic. Yeah, the purple one does worse, which is the isotropic. Yes, yeah, so we need the uh, orientation for accurate growth. Yes. Um, okay, so that's in the zebrafish jaw joints. Um, but what about the mouse that we started off with? So Joe um, got Ewing's data and basically implemented the exact same simulation um, for the mouse, uh, except that she didn't have orientation because the mouse data from, from the synchrotron imaging, it isn't the same mice that we looked at over different stages. They're different animals. And so we can't track individual cells. We can just track kind of the number and uh, location of cells. Um, and yes, despite this, she got a really nice prediction. So blue here is the initial shape of TS23 and green is, uh, sorry, orange, orange is the predicted shape and green is the target shape. Um, and so you can see here's really striking um, um, prediction of shape. Um, and what this indicates that in contrast to the fish in the mouse, growth orientation is not critical to uh, joint shape. Um, so it's, it's, it's complicated. Um, so to, um, yeah, so here, just to kind of compare then between uh, the, what, what was I saying here? Oh yeah, so, so even, yeah, so even though we saw differences in orientation, both mechanoregulated uh, changes in orientation and then differences in between the regions in the cell level data, those did not translate to changes in the simulation. So, um, next then. So, okay, so we've, we've seen then that uh, we have, in the cell level data, we saw that there were differences between the cell level effects depending on the um, age of the animal. But what had never been, what hadn't been looked at before is what happens in vivo. So in, in the, you know, most of the studies, including some from our group, focused on one particular, or a couple of early stages in skeletal development. And, and no one had looked what happens as the mouse develops in vitro. So that we, in Vivian's PhD, this is what she looked at. She looked at two different stages, 24 and 27. So 27 is effectively the, the latest kind of prenatal stage you can image reliably. Um, and uh, so this is TS24. These are all different measurements uh, and, and images of, of TS24 for limb. And if we look here at the humerus, we can see that the muscleless limb humerus is smaller, it has a malformed humeral head. The um, scapular shape is abnormal. So there's lots of differences that we can visually see and also lots of significant differences specifically about shape. Um, if we looked at TS27, there were still some significant differences. So, so we made about, there was about 20 measurements on four of them and these five were significant. But if we look at the shapes, uh, basically they do, they have become more normal over development. So this is despite any um, skeletal muscle contractions, any, any spontaneous movements. So effectively, there's some aspects of shape recovery uh, in utero. And it was even more, and, and, oh yeah, sorry, and then for cavitation. So cavitation has previously been very strongly linked with shape, joint shape, and, and the, the dogma, which, which we also believed was that if you didn't have joint cavitation, you definitely wouldn't have normal joint shape. Um, but, and, and the, so in the, and it was known that cavitation didn't happen in the muscles limbs, and what we found is that it doesn't recover over the time. So at TS27, the elbow, so TS24, the elbow joint is uncavitated, shoulder joint is partially cavitated, and that's still true in the later stages. So these improvements in joint shape happened despite any cavitation um, improvements, kind of separating the importance of cavitation from the importance of morphogenesis. Um, and then, yeah, so then in the hind limb, it was, it, was, it was the same thing, except even more pronounced. So we have a number, five different significant differences in terms of shape in the hind limb. Um, and, and, and visual differences, so abnormal contour shape, abnormal femoral head, and uh, acetabulum. Um, uh, which, but then by the time we get to TS27, the shapes look pretty normal, and we have no significant shape differences at TS27 in the hind limb. So effectively, no complete recovery of shape, um, not size actually. Uh, the, the length doesn't completely recover, but if we look at the shape, it, it has recovered. Um, Again, when we look at cavitation, cavitation doesn't recover, so we still, the hip joint isn't cavitated at TS24 or TS27, and yet we still get these uh, uh, recovery in shape. Um, mineralization was interesting. Um, 
basically, when we looked at mineralization at TS24, we had all these significant differences in, in the foreland and the hindland for rudiment length and rudiment mineralization. Um, when we get to TS27, we lose most of those differences. So effectively, mineralization, mineralization catches up uh, by the later stage, despite the absence of any spontaneous movements. In fact, in some rudiments, the ulna and the tibia, uh, the relative amount of mineralization actually overshot. So we got more mineralization in the uh, relative to length in these rudiments. So, I mean, the big question here is, what, is what's going on? Um, and the um, theory uh, that we developed was that there are external movement, external mechanical forces that can affect an embryo in utero. Um, now, this idea, uh, I had this idea a very long time ago. So this in 2010, this, this was a review paper um, where I showed the kind of summary of the literature that's been done on chicken mouse embryos where you somehow alter the movements in utero or in ovo. Um, so in the chick, when you stop them moving, um, everything's affected. All joints, all bones, everything that's been studied has been shown to be affected. In the mouse, even when you immobilize them, um, some bones and joints aren't affected. Some have been like affected at some stages and not others. Um, and the big difference between a chick embryo and a mouse embryo, uh, well, one of the big differences is the chick develops in an egg, uh, ex external to the mother, and doesn't get much external mechanical stimulation. And then the egg might get turned a couple of times a day, and well, that's about it. Um, a mouse, like a human, is getting, a human baby is getting moved all the time. You know, they're sloshing around in amniotic fluid, the mother goes for a jog, you know, they're getting lots of external mechanical stimulation. Um, and in, in front of the paper using computational modeling back in 2011, which, because of the differences between how the forelimb and the hind limb are, their kind of size and shape, the same tiny movement, I think it's 10 microns applied to the uh, hind limb or the fore, well, applied to each limb, leads to way higher stimulation of the hind limb compared to the forelimb. And the hind limb is the one that is much less severely affected. And the hypothesis was that it's because of the external loading. So it was just a hypothesis. It was very hard to figure out how to actually test that hypothesis. But um, we did. So you may again um, did this project where we, a crazy project in a way, but um, yeah, uh, we had mice pregnant with muscles limb embryos uh, and they were put on a wheel for an hour a day, divided up into 15 minutes um, segments for three days. And then euthanized at, at 16 and a half days. So TS, which is TS25, around, you know, around, like similar, kind of within the data I've already shown. And we looked at, um, so far we've just looked at uh, rudiment length and mineralization. Um, and the, uh, well, the, the results were, were, were surprising. So here, this is data that's been, you know, is expected. So we just here have wild type and muscleless without wheel. And um, so in the, so, and this is rudiment length. So the humerus is shorter, the ulna is shorter, the scapula is shorter significantly. Uh, the radius not so much. And, and this isn't, you know, this is, was, would be expected. But when we put the muscleless, when the, when we looked at muscleless limb embryos that were on the wheel or had the wheel exercise, well, the mothers of the wheel exercise, basically in almost all cases, uh, recovered the length of the wild type uh, rudiments. So effectively, the three days of one hour a day of wheel exercise recovered the effects of absent spontaneous movements um, for this particular time point, which is pretty amazing. Um, when we looked at mineralization, it was the same trend. So between wild type and muscleless, you have these significant decreases. Um, when we applied the exercise um, for most rudiments, we recovered the wild type mineralization. Um, one thing we, uh, when we looked at relative mineral extent, so when we normalized mineralization to length, the differences aren't uh, significant. So, so we currently think that, that it's actually to do with the growth plate and the growth of the rudiment rather than the actual differentiation. Um, but we're still, we have, we have more to do on this. But that's, um, uh, it's pretty amazing because what it means is that if there was a safe way to, uh, so say if there's babies at increased risk of hip dysplasia or say arthrogryposis, if, uh, and at the moment nothing is done for them because 
you can't, there's never going to be uh, an intervention for a musculoskeletal condition or unlikely to be anytime soon anyway. But maternal exercise could be a really safe way to promote skeletal development for their babies. Okay, uh, so then the, I think the final part is, is to explore a bit then what's the mechanism um, underlying the mechanoregulation of joint shape morphogenesis. Uh, and prenatal skeletal development. Um, so um, the, we chose to look at TRIP-V4, which is a channel um, that, uh, sorry, I'll just explore the yes, but this, and this was work uh, led by Dr. Nadal Khatib. Um, and uh, so trip, why do we look at TRIP-V4? So TRIP-V4 is, invo is involved in a, a large number of skeletal developmental disorders, uh, and then separately, it's also been shown to be a really important mechanoregulator, including in um, skeletal cells. Uh, but all the work has been done, well, not all, a lot of the work has been done in vitro. And no one has uh, so far looked at uh, its role in mechanoregulation of skeletal development. And indeed, when it comes to specifically joint morphogenesis, there haven't been any um, genetic mechanisms identified for the mechanoregulation of, of that process. So what Nadal did was he used a method that was developed um, a good while ago by Dikesh Barry, who was a PhD student uh, early on in the group, um, of culturing limbs. So except in, in Nadal's case, we were culturing um, mouse limbs rather than chick. Uh, so we cultured them for six days. So the embryonic limbs uh, harvested and cultured. Um, and so first of all, um, because we hadn't, uh, we hadn't, we focused on the chick and focused on the mouse, we had to first um, demonstrate that the model works for mice. Um, so interestingly, from mineralization, we didn't see any significant effects of dynamic loading. So the comparison here is, is, is both culture. One is statically cultured and the other is dynamically loaded for six days. So mineralization wasn't affected, which is interesting. Um, and we think is related to the fact that in the mouse, you need invasion of blood supply for mineralization, which you don't need in the chick. The chick has a slightly different version of endochondral ossification. Um, but when we looked at joint shape, um, we saw uh, a large number of significant differences in terms of, of growth, but and which were actually visible. So here, this is the dynamic, so dynamic culture limbs here in the purple. You can see they're wider, and we have more pronounced um, condylar outgrowth, um, and that was reflected in significant differences. So that was great because we were able, been able to show then using our model, uh, bioreactor system, that mechanical loading has a, um, a measurable uh, impact on uh, morphogenesis. Uh, we did then is or what Nat and Zell did was to look up okay what's happened with trip B4 um, and what if the data shows is the trip B4 is mechanoregulated in the joint more in the joint epiphysis so um, here the, where the boxes are that's the, the, the condyles uh, the medial condyle and the lateral condyle where we're looking at two different halves of the of the joint um, and there was a, a significant decrease in trip B4 expression well first of all between well, the back first sorry between static and dynamic so when there was static loading we had hardly any uh, trip v4 expression in the um condyles and um, what what nadal did then was blocked trip v4 so because that's a great thing about this bioreactor system is we can block any anything that there's a drug for we can block and was it, there is a drug for blocking trip v4 um so when we drop trip block trip v4 we basically get back to the kind of level of static uh, trip v4 expression so and, and I don't show it here because there wasn't space, but in the static culture, when trip V4 was blocked, there was no um, significant difference in terms of trip V4 expression. Well, this actually, it's here in the graph. So trip V4 intensity, we have this uh, significant increase in the dynamic control, so the dynamic with without drop blocking trip V4, which is then um, eliminated when we either have static culture or block trip V4. So this basically then together shows that trip V4 is mechanoregulated during uh, cartilage morphogenesis or joints or cartilage, yeah, joints. And then, so this, is, so James, James has his whole other project, but was involved in a really lovely way in this, in this particular project um, by looking at, okay, what, what is the, what are the stresses in these developing, sorry, in these cultured limbs under dynamic loading? Um, so, and what the data shows really nicely is that the, the you know, we have certain regions of elevated trip before, even in, in the dynamic simulations only. So it, particularly this corner here, the medial condyle, which is which is um, co-located, co-localized with uh, regions of higher stress. 
Um, another interesting thing from the FE results, uh, the final number results, is that we have kind of stress shielding at the um, bone collar. Um, and uh, this, so what we saw consistently actually is in the growth phase, we saw consistently high levels of trip V4, regardless of static culture or blocking trip V4. So there's something, something complex and other going on at the growth plate that we don't fully understand yet. One possibility is that because the cells are swelling, they are, um, there is trip V4 expression being upregulated there, but we, yeah. But, um, but certainly in the joint cartilage, we, we saw, you know, um, indications of a link between mechanical stress and trip V4 expression. Um, so the, the, then we looked at what happens with um, shape, with the, oh yeah, so we, okay, so we already looked at, um, we know that shape was affected by dynamic, dynamic loading. What happens with blocking, trip V4 blocking? So um, here is our uh, static blocked and static control. They're pretty similar, but our dynamic blocks so is when we drop block trip V4 activity, we basically get back to almost the shape of static. So the, the effect of dynamic loading on joint shape is eliminated when we block trip V4. So the mechanical regulation of joint shape is mediated by trip V4. Just it's borne out by the statistics that there was not really, you know, there was one significant difference between in shape between static control and static block. So trip V4 blocking isn't having an impact when uh, in static culture. So it's, it is definitely being a mediator there of mechanical loading. And yet we have all these significant differences between the dynamic control shapes and the dynamic block. And um, so uh, the, this is the same one again. Yeah. So the next thing then was to look at, okay, so, uh, okay, so we've shown that trip 4 is, is mediating the mechanical regulation of, of joint shape. Um, what's happening, you know, what, what if we go uh, a level up in terms of what's happening at the cell level, uh, particularly mediating the, the growth and shape change. So we looked at proliferation to look at this. So, so first of all, we see a significant difference between uh, a proliferation between the static and dynamically cultured limbs. Uh, and this is actually the first evidence that proliferation in cartilage is mechanically mediated, apart from Yuming's work, which also hasn't been published yet. So um, but when we block trip V4, um, we go right back down almost to the level of the, of the static control. Um, and, and the static blocks, there wasn't much of, it, of an impact. Um, so what we've shown here is that the, when, so the action, the mechan regulated action of trip 4 is directly affecting uh, cell proliferation. Oh, there's the significant differences. Um, and then finally, the last thing we looked at is, okay, what's happening at the level of the matrix? Um, so we looked at, we used Tolgine Blue to look at cultural cyclone deposition. And here we have our static, control or dynamic control um, and focusing in on the joint regions we, we have increased um, a protein glycan deposition in our dynamic controls um, when trip before is blocked we lose that so basically we have similar levels of protein glycan deposition between our static control and our dynamic blocked so so trip before we have a link between trip before um, proliferation and matrix production and we found the same a similar thing for collagen deposition, not quite as pronounced as the protein glycans, but similar thing where, where the dynamically cultured ones, we had more um, collagen deposition, which, but then when trip before was blocked, we again had, had slightly, or apparently less uh, collagen deposition in our dynamic blocked. So to kind of put, it, put all those results together, when we um, mechanically stimulate developing joints, uh, we get changes in growth and shape, um, which are um, correlated with changes in trip 4 ex in expression. Uh, trip 4 expression is also co-localizes co with regions of high stress in the joint shape, in the joint epiphyses. Um, and the um, trip 4 the act, the kind of mechanism that trip 4 is acting through is proliferation, mechanically mediated proliferation, um, and uh, matrix deposition. Um, so that's basically science. Yeah, acknowledge, I'll, I'll acknowledge, I'd like to acknowledge Saima, who was post up in the group, who worked on several of these projects. I didn't present her work today, but she was involved in lots of them. The collaborators on this work, so Christy Hammond, Hannah Isaacson, who was involved heavily with the, the synchrotron, or the synchrotron work, uh, David Hoey in, in Trinity, who's involved with the trip before, uh, the funders, um, and then some thank you. So, 
Um, huge thank you to my group. So the four, the four over there, they spent the whole day today clearing out the lab. Um, a big thank you to all of the staff here. Um, and yeah, that's it, thank you. You better, better ask ask some hardcore science questions. Oh yeah, audience, sorry, yeah. Yeah. I think Daryl had the hand up first. Yeah. Steve, that was fantastic. Thank thank you for that. That was wonderful. It's it's so great to have time with you and, and to hear what you're up to. Um I guess it was, there's so many questions I was thinking about this as you went through, and I love the, the story about the external forces, which was mm -hmm. brilliant. But also at the end of here, I mean with, can you use a trip before agonist to try to recover some of the, the loss <coughs> you saw in the, in the muscleless mutants? Great to... idea. Yes. So we thought about that. We didn't have time to do the the agonists, right? We only did the antagonists. I always get those two mixed up. I can't keep that in my head. Um, so we did do it for collagens. So, um, and that was Simon, that Simon's work they didn't talk about. So with Simon, what we did was we harvested the muscleless limbs, cultured them in the bioreactor to see if mechanical loading could recover normal collagen expression. And um, what we found was it did, but only for some, so collagen two, collagen 10 were recovered in some aspects, but not completely normal. So we, we, did, we didn't do it for Trippy 4, but we certainly uh, could and should. Um, it definitely be cool to see. Can we do that? Because see, trip before is already in clinical trials, you know, as as a drug. Um, and uh, so, for example, trip before could be used if you have a baby with arthrogryposis and they're undergoing physio and lots of surgeries. And if if you could give them a drug safely, uh, that would increase their cartilage's response to mechanical loading, so physio or whatever. Then you could accelerate their recovery. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's exciting to think about. Very much. That was very interesting. I was particularly intrigued by sort of the distinction between shape and size differences in these. And in a lot of the plots that you show, it looked like it was two D projections of shape, or maybe it was a two D section. Did you also look at three D shape changes in pool? Yeah. So we have three D shape for everything. Um, so those are two D sections. Um, and you know, it's it, it has been a challenge over the whole. You know, the, the whole for lots of, for all the group really. We have this three D data. How do we effectively show it? So James actually has done has been doing some really nice work where he kind of makes average shapes of uh, so we have a group there's lots of variation because particularly the chicks are genetically you know they're not identical gen genetically um, and you know I think that is uh, we're we're kind of probably several of us have adopted that uh, several like you know current projects have adopted that method uh, it is all 3D so the measurements that I showed um, they're all done on the 3D shapes um, but I, yeah. The 2D sections aren't aren't exactly, but yeah, yeah, we could do better in displaying it. Lovely talk, very okay. elegant experiments. Yeah. The trip before stuff was interesting, not just, I mean, uh, all kinds of fun things going on there, but the one thing that struck me was that the variance goes down when you antagonize the receptor as well as the differences. So mm. with both the mobilized and the non-mobilized, so the, the, the actual range of data that you got collapsed in both both the mobilized and non mobilized. It, do you have an idea about what's happening there? I don't think did, I, mean, did, I didn't actually notice that before, but now you say it, I can see that. The, yeah, I can see in my head that the, the dots are closer together. Well, there's casual inspection. To yes. Yeah. 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 But you know the way sometimes you look at data for ages and you never yeah. you don't notice anything. Yeah. Um. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. We we'll, uh, wish it. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't, um, yeah, I mean, trip before, so like at the start of this project, we were like, okay, we could look at piezo, we could look at trip before, we could look at integrins, and, um, you know, it, it, we, we, it was partly practical reasons why we chose trip before that was an easy and not too expensive uh, drug uh, to block it, um, but it is amazing how, how pronounced its effects are, you know, previously in, in a chick study, we blocked stretch activated channels and voltage gated channels 
And both of those had pretty extreme effects as well. But they're general, you know, they're very broad spectrums of channels. So trip before is just one channel. And it had these, you know, it eliminated the effects of mechanical loading in the cartilage. So, you know, I'd love to look at integrins or piezo or whatever, and then look at what's happening in the growth plate. Um, so, yeah, lots more to look into. But also from a sort of position of complete ignorance of development, how, how the fact that any, any mobilization, I just put the mouse on a wheel, caused orientational differences. So the orientation differences, so we didn't look at orientation in the wheel. We only looked at orientation in the muscleless limb mice. Uh, so those are ones where, yeah, the, um, uh, yeah, so the, the movement, movement starts at around TS21, TS22, and the orientation differences became obvious by TS24. So that's about two days, a day and a half, maybe mm -hmm. later. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because orientation has been, uh, you know, a key, like, so um, in other model systems, orientation has been key for morphogenesis. So it's kind of confusing because we're getting conflicting results about whether or not it's uh, involved. Uh, definitely the simulation would indicate, and, and I believe the simulation because it synthesizes all the information that we can actually measure. Um, because the simulation is pretty accurate prediction, I, I would believe that orientation is not important for those particular stages, but it could be that later on it's, it's needed, probably is. Dangerously, I'm going to ask you about one of your throwaway lines in your presentation. Mm -hmm. And just chuck it back at me if, if this is totally off beat. You mentioned joint cavitation. So is that knuckle cracking? Is that what you're talking about? No. Okay, so what do you mean? So joint cavitation happens in the early embryo, and it's the first uh, indication that the joint is... So when, you're, when your arm first formed, it was one continuous cartilage and laga, it's called, uh, which branched into two different branches. So that was how your arm started. Um, and the first indication of your elbow joint, which was, was where uh, the interzone formed, so a gap, well, soon to be a gap formed in your elbow. And cavitation is what separates the continuous cartilage on that into, into a joint. Okay, so can you just explain again then? So in the muscleless model, does that not happen? No, it doesn't happen, no. In some joints. And it was previously assumed, including by us. So what we did in the chick model, so Davy there, who is smiling up at us there, where her project, her PhD project, was on artificially inducing a cavity in the chick immobilized joint. And when she artificially induced a cavity, we saw improvements in joint shape. So what we said in that paper is, oh, you know, this shows, you know, joint cavitation inextricably linked with joint morphogenesis. But what this data shows is that it's that the joints can actually continue to grow and become more normal in shape despite the lack of a complete cavity. Um, yeah, so we haven't we haven't we haven't published that yet. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just different. It's um, yeah, it's interesting. And then, if I may follow up, so you talk about length changes as perhaps being different mm. in in some of these. So can you just explain for naive old me? Where the growth occurs for length then, mm. in, in, these, in these models that you have, mm. and how that compares to the human model. Mm. So all, all the growth happens at the growth plate. So uh, as part of endochondral ossification, the chondrocytes undergo hypertrophy, they swell massively, and it's actually that swelling of the hypertrophic chondrocytes which promotes longitudinal expansion <coughs> excuse me, of our bones. So it's the same for chick, mouse, uh, human, but the difference between chick and mouse and human, is that instead of their um, host hypertrophic chondrocytes getting replaced by bone, which is what happens in, in us and in mice, uh, they, it gets replaced by a marrow cavity. So that is why chicken bones are hollow, because they have a slightly different end of an endochondral ossification process compared to us. So that's why you don't give your dog a chicken bone. Because, they, because of the differences in endochondral ossification. And then, then that's back to dinosaurs as well. And, you know, it's, it's, um, the, their bones are lighter, but they're less strong. So if I may offer you another model that might be of use, and that is child amputees, who have um, variable growth of their limb, of their remaining limb, obviously due to uh, affected growth plates, but they also have 
um, the opportunity for mechanical stimulation that is very directed and localized because you can access the bones very easily in one of those limbs. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's something to play with. Yeah, certainly. <coughs> I'm here, nice to see you. I need you to be. I'm Kirk, as usual. Um, when you have your ankle in plaster or something like that, and the plaster gets taken off, it's very difficult to walk because things seem to grow or change shape while you've been immobilized. So I guess my question is, is this just during development? I mean, the implication is that things switch off, or is it the same mechanism that carries on afterwards? So with an ankle, so if your ankle is in a cast, it's primarily muscle that you, so you've lost muscle tone um, over that time. So the, the interesting thing about the joints, all the joints I've, I've shown today, all the shapes today, they are completely cartilaginous. So when a baby is born, uh, most of their joint epiphyses, so the bits at the end, are either completely cartilaginous or maybe have a small little sphere of bone, which is the secondary ossification center. And um, so in so once we're post skeletal maturity, um, we have a layer of articular cartilage at the ends of our joints. But that so the but the, the process of morphogenesis has finished. Our, our bones are set in those shapes. But like it, it still goes on during adolescence. So like you know the cam morphology of the hip is a, is a common. Um, condition in particularly very sporty people, very sporty teenagers, and that is linked to you know uh, abnormal or repetitive loading on the joint, which then alters it, its its shape uh, in a way that then is becomes uh, a pathology. And so, so yeah, up until but once skeletal maturity is finished, the, these kind of processes are are done. I wanted to follow up on something Danny was uh, saying, and it also struck me. Do you have a sense for how specific the mechanical stimulus needs to be to have the effects that you describe? Is it just any stimulus above a certain threshold, or would, would it be a specific stimulus that is needed? Do you mean specific magnitude or specific type? Both, both actually. Yeah. Frequency. Yeah. Frequency. Yeah. Frequency. Oh, direction, yeah. magnitude. <laughs> Okay, well, so we had a paper on that. So <laughs> Nadal, uh, Nadal's paper, Nadal and Christian together uh, came out last year where we looked at the effect of frequency and magnitude, frequency and duration of load actually, and the chick limb. And um, uh, one, ha one was important, more important than the other. Frequency was more important. Duration was, duration was more important <laughs> than frequency. Um, uh, so, um, I think, but I think in vivo though, um, I think there's a minimum threshold of loading over which it doesn't matter. So I was talking to Yuming's external ex uh, examiner, so Naomi and Yanlan about this. Like, you know, if you if you exercise loads, do you get like a super baby? You know, and but my my feeling is is <laughs> is no. <laughs> um, my my feeling is more there's a, a level below if it falls below a certain healthy level of mechanical stimulation. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it, it won't, uh, unless you go below a threshold, it won't make a difference. Or, but, but then I was very surprised, so I didn't show the data here because we had a very small N number, but uh, we, we did have a small number of wild type mouse embryos on the wheel and they increased their rudiment length and mineralization and they're healthy embryos. So, so basically, we, we, so I was shocked at that and, and they are, it is a small sample size, but I'm definitely keen to look at more because that would mean then that you know, maternal exercise could be actually influencing uh, baby's bones. Um, but it's a bold claim, so we're not making it yet. <laughs> and yeah. That was actually the question that I wanted to pick up on is exactly that, is do they see any correlations? And I'm not talking about a super exercising mothers because uh, that's time for that. But in mothers who are potentially on bed rest or for whatever reason unable to move during pregnancy, do they see any birth defects more common in those or limb more bone morphogenesis issues later on or is that just not known yet so skeletal development uh, is very poorly studied in in neonates um and in babies in general um and it's something you know I, so i've been working with ravi for years at ravi vadianathan in mechanical engineering on a fetal movement sensor and what i really want to do once that's developed um eventually um is correlate fetal movement over pregnancy with skeletal health after birth um 
and um, yeah, I mean the bed rest, the, 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 the complicating thing, a lot of the reason why women are, have to do bed rest coming to the end of pregnancy is because of um, amniocet or like a reduced amniotic fluid and reduced amniotic fluid is correlated with hip dysplasia. So because the babies aren't as free to move. Um, so then it's, it's, so for those kind of situations, it's hard then to separate, okay, is it because the mother isn't moving as much or is it because the baby isn't moving as much? Um, but it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Did you mean so did you mean have a wild type plus wheel control group? Oh yeah, so that was what I just said. Um yeah, so we did have a wild type plus wheel, very small sample numbers, N, N of three. And it did it did show an increase uh, compared to the wild type group. So we're certainly excited to look more at that. Yeah. If you why a muscle rather than say, I don't know, curare or something like that, where yeah. the muscle would still because I mean the cells are not just there to move the muscle, mm -hmm. not to move them, but you know, they're spewing out chemicals mm -hmm. and doing all sorts of interesting things, even when they're not moving. Great question. Yeah. So well the they, they did do those experiments on mouse embryos, extremely extremely hard to do because you're yeah. But what we did do to answer this question is we had another mouse line called MDG, which is muscular dysgenesis, which is where the mus muscle forms but doesn't contract. So, okay, so we don't have a completely normal biochemical environment, but we do have, it's a bit more normal. Um, and we, we, saw, we saw similar effects in terms of shape and things like that. Um, uh, so, but the surgery route, yeah, I mean, um, I think getting that past the home office would have been very difficult um, and also very, very challenging. Uh, but it is true, we are missing all of the factors from the muscle uh, and, and the, the came down to practicalities in the end, the MDG was, line was very hard to breed. Um, and so that, that's why we did the majority of work on the splotch delayed, which is the particular, which is muscle-less. And other natural human knockouts that are similar, like amongst royalty, for example, or other inbred human groups, endogamous groups, Record. Um, so, um, <laughs> um, so there are conditions, uh, very rare but severe conditions, where, where well, like say spinal muscular atrophy. So it's it's where yeah, the, the, there's a number of conditions that can lead to um, akinesia. So basically, baby not moving, and, and there's sim in terms of the effects on the skeleton, it's it's similar. You know, thin, hypermineralized bones of normal shapes. But when a baby doesn't move in utero, they there's they, they usually can't breathe after they're born they have a severe other health complications and it's usually lethal when they so when fads is fetal akinasia deformation sequence and and that's almost always neonatal very rare though thankfully 